أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما صلى الله عليك وعلى رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد خاتم النبيين وإمام المرسلين. Over the next a uh, few episodes over in this particular series, um, we're going to cover various counsels of some of the greatest spiritual masters of the Islamic tradition. Um, some of these include Imam Shafi'i, Imam Hassan al-Basri, Imam Sufyan al-Thawri, Imam Malik al dinar um, Imam Ibn Qayyim al Jawziya uh, and others. In this particular uh, first few episodes, I would like to go over some of the counsels of Imam al Junaid. Now, Imam al Junaid, uh, also known as Imam al Junaid al Baghdadi, um, or also known as Sayyid al Ta'ifa, the master of the group, or uh, the master of the, of the group, of the fellowship. Um, Imam al Junaid doesn't actually have any of his works. Um, that were written during his time preserved to our day. A lot of his stuff has been lost and basically what we have are scattered statements and scattered counsels of Imam al Junaid that you will find across several works of several scholars. And interestingly enough, he spans all types of scholars. So it doesn't matter if you um, uh, incline towards a particular uh, approach to Islam regardless of what that approach has been called, you will find Imam al junaid statements uh, throughout the scholars in that approach. Um, which is interesting because that indicates the truth value of uh, his statements, that they span uh, what can be considered a sectarianism today. Now Imam al junaid uh, he was born in the year uh, 220 after Hijran, he passed away in the year 297. Um, which is about 1200 years ago now and um, his name <coughs> was Abu Qasim al Junaid ibn Muhammad al Zajjaj um, and his father used to sell glass and that's where the name al Zajjaj comes from and also he was called al Qawariri because he used to make uh, bottles now he was born and raised and lived and passed away in Baghdad uh, modern day Iraq and uh, that's basically as much as you will find in a lot of the uh, books on biographies. Like I said, there isn't much that is known about him um, except certain aspects of his life that indicate his, uh, his status. Now, something that has been mentioned about him is that uh, his, uh, his uh, maternal uncle, Sari al-Saqati, who he used to sit in his gatherings. He used to be a scholar in his own right. And Imam al-Junaid actually says about that, he said that uh, there was one day where he was in the gathering of Sari al-Saqati, his maternal uncle, and he was seven years old. And amongst the people, they were talking about thankfulness, showing thankfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and gratitude. And so Sari al-Saqati called on to al-Junaid and he said to him, Ya Ghulam, ma shukr, O child, what is thankfulness? What is gratitude? And Imam al-Junaid said, Allah ta'asri Allah Allah bi ni'amihi. That you do not uh, disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala using his blessings upon you. So, for example, you have the power to stand up, to walk, you have legs, um, you have energy. All of these are blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he's given you to direct towards a particular action that is in his obedience. His disobedience using his blessings is to take that power, to take this energy that you have and take yourself on to the nightclub downtown. That is disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his blessings. Now to be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to avoid doing these things. Because there is nothing in this world 
except that Allah possesses. So basically it's for you to direct it towards his obedience. Sariya Saqati responded back to him and said, Akhsha ayyakuna hadhaka min Allahi lisanak. That I fear that your share from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your tongue. And Al Junaid said, Fala azalu abki ala hadihi al kalimati lati qalaha sariyuli. I have ever since been crying over this statement that Sariya Saqati has said to me. Now, Sariya Saqati is saying, I'm worried about you that this very profound statement that you just said, that you do not disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his blessing, this very deep profound statement that you said at seven years old. I'm concerned that that might just be it for you, that you would just utter things with your tongue and not actually implement them. Which is really the case for a lot of us today. We make a lot of claims. There's a, a lot of Muslims make all kinds of claims. And um, yours truly is guilty of it, just like the next guy. And um, it's very easy to say things. It's very easy to utter things with your tongue. It doesn't take that much energy. The difficulty is in implementing into action what you say. You can talk about thankfulness all you want. You can talk about patience all you want. We can have lectures upon lectures on patience. But at the very first sign of tribulation, if you don't show that patience, then all of that has been a waste. And in fact, it becomes a proof against you. The thing about ilm in Arabic knowledge, ilm, if you take the letters and switch them around, you get amal, you get action. Now, any knowledge that you have, anything that you learn, that you are not able to transform into action in some way, either it will become a proof against you or it was just a waste of time. It was not beneficial knowledge to begin with. So reflect upon your day <clears throat> and much of the conversations that you engage in, much of what you learn. Um, you watch the news all the time, you check your Twitter timeline, you do all these things and you find out about things that are happening across the world, you find out about things that are happening all over the place. The question you should ask yourself is, okay, so you found all of these things out, what is your plan of action in response to this knowledge? If you don't have a plan of action, either that knowledge, because you're not able to transform it, either it was not beneficial knowledge and so you just wasted a whole lot of time, or you need to check yourself before you wreck yourself. So that's the, uh, the advice that basically, the indirect way of ad uh, advising al Junaid that Sarai Saqati gave him. Now this story is indicative of the fact that Imam al Junaid was actually in the company of his uncle and listening to the, to the circles of knowledge and just around it, and so from a very young age. And so he gained some of that, he took some of that in. And um, at the very beginning, his fiqh was uh, basically on uh, uh, the people of hadith. And he actually became a master at it. And he began giving fatwas at the age of 20 years old. Now to be able to give, I mean, that was a time when it, things were much more tightly controlled. You couldn't just get up and start giving fatwas just because you happen to have a good tongue on you. And you happen to say things in a way that people liked you had to actually know what you were talking about. Like Imam Malik, he was allowed to give fatwa when he was 17 years old. And he was given permission by the scholars in, the, uh, in Medina, in the mosque. So this is indicative of his intellect, that at a very young age he was able to start giving fatwas. Um, he also uh, managed to... Uh, get into the circle of Al-Harith al-Muhasibi, who's another great spiritual master. Um, and uh, it's been said about him that, uh, actually before we say what has been said about him, his uncle, Sariya Saqalti, said, تَكَلَّمْ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَكَانَ فِي قَلْبِي حِشْمَةٌ مِنَ التَّكَلُّمْ That his uncle, Sariya Saqalti, ordered him, go and speak to the people and start giving advice and teach. And Imam al-Junaid was feeling unworthy of that. He didn't think that he was of a caliber to be able to speak to the people. So he said that he used to always accuse himself, which is actually one of the things that you need to be doing all the time. Um, and this is going to come in one of his counsels, that you should not be observing your uprightness. You should not be thinking that you're upright. That's one of the signs of being deluded about yourself. Um, constantly having this idea of, Accusing yourself of deficiency, which it is, it's just a reality, acknowledging the deficiency of yourself um, is the way to be. And so he, from the very beginning, he had that kind of inclination of just, I'm just going to 
you know, I don't feel like I'm worthy of teaching here. So he saw in his sleep a dream where the Prophet Sallallahu comes to him and it was a night of Jum'ah. And he said to him, Takallam ala nas. So the Prophet Sallallahu comes to Imam al junaid in a dream and tells him, get up and teach the people. So he got up and he said, he went to uh, the door of uh, his uncle, knocked it before the morning. And as Sari Saqati came out and, and he heard him tell him about the dream and he said, Lam tu hatta qila lak. You didn't believe me until it was told to you, basically by the Prophet. You were ordered now. Um, some have said about him that uh, there's a, a Mu'tazilite scholar, Al Ka'bi al Mu'tazili, he said to some of the Sufis in town in Baghdad, I saw in Baghdad for you guys a sheikh, a scholar. He's called Al Junaid. My eye has never seen anybody like him. That people used to come and write simply just because of the, the phrases, the rhetoric, the, the eloquence of his words. They just wanted to catch that and write that down. And the philosophers, the logicians, um, and that's not to say that they're both the same thing, but the philosophers and the logicians used to come to his uh, circle so that they can just listen to the precise nature of his words. He was very specific in his talk, and that's something that you notice logicians are very specific about. And the poets used to come for his, just his eloquence and rhetoric again, is just because they... They wanted to catch the beauty of his uh, expressions. And the theologians used to come for the meanings that he used to, to infer and the things that he used to speak about. And so it was basically recognized that Imam al-Junaid, whatever he talked about, he was very, he, he seemed like he was the master in that field. And in fact, it was said about him that um, uh, during his time and even in our time, you'll find that a lot of people, a lot of scholars, either they have uh, a lot of knowledge or they have a state. So it depends on the scholar and I'm sure a lot of you guys would would attest to this. You've met some scholars. Some scholars recognize their level of knowledge. It's just amazing. They can talk about anything and everything and they seem to master every single field. On the other hand, you have other scholars that who are not really as much of a, at, at that level of mastery but they happen to um, get to a, a, a state where even in their presence, you feel closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just their spiritual state, their being, you just feel it. Imam al-Junaid combined the two. So you hear him talk, you think that he's a person of just great knowledge but no state. But then you listen, you sit with him and you feel the spiritual presence. Um, some things that have been narrated about him uh, where they actually go into a little bit of an exaggeration is that Imam Junaid, uh, the way he used to earn his income, he had a market, uh, he had a store in the market and uh, he used to go and uh, they said before he would open his door um, for public to sell, he used to pray 400 rak'ah. And um, that might, Allahu A'lam, but that might be a little bit of an exaggeration. Um, some scholars say that it was most likely that he would pray his uh, sunnah of 8 rak'ah of uh, Salat al-Duha and then he would open this, the store because 400 rak'ah you take all day. Um, but at any rate, uh, we can go on and on about Imam al uh, uh from the things that have been said about him. Uh, for example, it was said that he had uh, actually done 30 pilgrimages, hajj, Walking. So he walked from Baghdad to Mecca 30 times. Um, so anyways, his, uh, his, what, his legacy that's been left to us is not necessarily in his fiqh. Uh, the fiqh is uh, tons of scholars out there. A lot of statements, a lot of things. But the thing that he left us behind was taking the fiqh from an outward reality into an inward reality. So his fiqh was an inward fiqh as opposed to an outward fiqh. And you will see this as we go through these councils of Imam al-Junaid. And um, it was said that when he passed away, about 60,000 people prayed at his janazah in Baghdad. And while he was on his deathbed, and it was a, a Friday that this happened, he was reciting Quran while he's, you know, breathing his last breaths. 
And Abu Muhammad al-Hariri, his companion, he said, Ya Abul Qasim, irfiq bi nafsik. Oh Abul Qasim, just take it easy on yourself. And he said, Ya Abu Muhammad, he responded back to him, Oh Abu Muhammad, ma ra'aytu ahadan ahwaja ilayhi minni fi hadha al-waqt wa huwa dhatu wa sahifati. I did not see anyone who is in more need of this, this recitation of the Qur'an, than myself, while my sheet is being folded over now. Uh, of his actions. Rahimahullah, wa nafa'ana Allahu bihi wa iyaakum fi al-dharayni, ameen. May Allah benefit us from him in, his, in this world and in the next. Now, the major things about Imam al-Junaid for him was, during his time, uh, the Sufis have basically started transgressing and going beyond the Sharia. And this deals with the idea of uh, innovations and introducing things into the religion that is not from it. Now there is a, a foundational principle in Usul, which is in Ibadah, in worship, Al-Aslu fil Ibadah al-Tahrim. So it's the 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 uh, first start off position in worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is impermissibility except for what has been prescribed. So we don't introduce into the religion, into Islam, acts of worship that have not been introduced by the Prophet ﷺ and dictated to us in the way that we do them. And al-asl fil ada al-hil. So whatever else outside of ibadah, the uh, start off position is that it's permissible unless you were given an order that it's impermissible. So all food is permissible except for pork, for example, ham, drinking alcohol. Why? Because we were told that these things are impermissible. And so that's the start-up. So when it comes to religion, you need to have evidence from the Qur'an or the Sunnah for you to be able to do these acts of worship. Unfortunately, and this is where Sufism gets its bad uh, name today, is that a lot of Sufis, um, or so-called Sufis, let's just say, um, introduce certain things into the religion that when you look at, when you ask them for evidence for it, some of them even get offended that you're asking for evidence and they go, would you a Salafi? As if being a Salafi is a bad thing. Um, like we said, the essence is that it's impermissible until you provide proof for it. Once you provide the proof, and if the scholars have differed about certain things, that's fine, but it's not, once you start labeling and, and throwing labels onto people, you actually start losing the essence of what this religion is about. So if the Sufi is accusing you of Salafism because you're asking for a proof, that is actually avoiding the, the issue, which is provide your evidence. You just called me a name to discredit me by calling me a Salafi. And the Salafi, when he sees someone that's doing something that they may not have come across, or they're not aware of the proof for it, oh, look at these Sufis. So you've just discredited the action of that person by calling him a Sufi, even though it could actually be something from the Sunnah. What we're in need of today is a bunch of... Sufi Salafis or Salafi Sufis, people that understand that the statement of Imam al-Shafi'i فَقِيهًا وَصُوفِيًّا فَكُنْ لَيْسَ وَاحِدًا فَإِنِّي وَحَقِّ اللَّهِ إِيَّاكَ أَنصَحُ فَهَذَا قَاسٍ لَمْ يَذُقْ قَلْبَهُ تُقًا وَهَذَا جَهُولٌ فَكَيْفَ يَصْرُحُ ذُو الْجَهْلِ That uh, Imam al-Shafi'i said to be a faqih or a Sufi, like one or the other, I give you sincere advice, don't be one of them. For the faqih, فَهَذَا قَاسٍ لَمْ يَذُقْ قَلْبَهُ تُقًا the one who is not taken up the sawuf, or this inward fiqh, this inward purification of the soul, that person is actually hard inside, and his heart has not tasted awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَهَذَا جَهُولٌ So if you decide to go, oh, I'm just going to go the, the path, the Sufism path, as if you can step on that path without mastering Qur'an and Sunnah. Imam al-Shafi'i says someone who does that is a jahul, he's an ignorant person. How can an ignorant person be upright? And so this is what really the message of Imam al-Junaid was about. Imam al-Junaid was always about basically adhering, and that's what he said, هذا بالكتاب والسنة, that if you're going to step on the path of tasawwuf, or some people call it zuhd and wara, I mean there's a la mushahata fi istilah, that we don't really focus so much on the names as much as we focus on the essence of the thing itself. So... You call it zuhd, you call it wara. A lot of the scholars, the tradition actually calls it Sufism, tasawwuf. It's not a bad word. Um, and don't be shy, shy to use it just because it's gotten a bad name by some of the followers uh, or some of the people who claim to be. Just like Salafism is not a bad thing. I mean, you want to adhere to the Salaf. Uh, 
I'm adhering to the Salaf by adhering to the school of Imam Malik, for example. He was a Salafi scholar. Um, tasawwuf, it's about purification of the self. It's not about going to graves and um, and uh, introducing innovations and bid'ah and all that stuff. It's, it's about adhering to the outward in order for you to purify the inward. So that was his issue. During his time, there was a lot of ignorance. There was a lot of things that are starting to spread. And his task was basically to bring back tasawwuf within the folds of Quran and Sunnah. And um, and that's really the thing. And to seeking knowledge, he said, That the first of obtaining knowledge is to sit at the feet of scholars, to sit with teachers, to study, to spend your time learning the Quran and learning the Sunnah. And then he said, So the next step, the next stage, so it's three stages of knowledge. The first stage is seeking it. The second stage is acting upon it. That's the fruit of knowledge. If you're not acting upon it, you cannot ask to be going to the third stage, which is that finally you start learn, receiving inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that would be based and this inspiration Imam, uh, has been said to be understanding you get depths of understanding the Quran and the Sunnah and embodying that in your life that's what it means to start receiving that's what that verse Allah wa Allah in Surah Al-Baqarah where Allah says uh, have awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he will teach you that's how he teaches you it gives you inspiration for additional understanding now this is really the and then uh, uh, the, the third thing after that is uh, so the first thing for Imam al-Junaid was bringing back tasawwuf within the folds of Quran and Sunnah the second one is how to seek knowledge and he basically emphasized that you first have to sit with the teachers and the shiyukh and the scholars the third thing is he was very weary of claims he said, The worst thing, the most harmful thing upon the people of belief and religion are claims. And the claims that he was talking about is um, claims of loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Claims of having the veil uplifted. Claims of being witnessing certain realities that uh, people are not aware of. Once you start making these claims, especially public, oh, I see this, and I, I got to see that, and in this dream, and I saw the inside of this, and what, like, as soon as you start making claims about, oh, I love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meanwhile, you're not praying, you're not doing anything, and, I mean, uh, love has conditions, it has signs, it has certain telltale things that you get to see, and so, Imam al-Junaid was saying, get away from claims, don't make any claims, don't make a claim that you're a Sufi, don't make a claim that you're a Salafi, don't make a claim that you're in love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't make any claims. Act. There is a sign. قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِكُمُ اللَّهِ That's Surah Al-Imran where the Pro Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet to tell us. Tell them if you love Allah, you're claiming to love Allah, then follow me. Follow the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And following him means what? Implementing his sunnah. Implementing his sharia. Ah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love you back. That's So it's this relationship has actually been dictated. What are the conditions for this relationship to be? And so Imam al is saying, stay away from claims. And you should actually be weary of people that are just making grandiose claims about all kinds of realities. Just act in silence. And then he also, uh, during his time, there were some people that were talking about, وَعْبُدْ رَبَّكَ حَتَّى يَتِيكَ الْيَقِينَ Surah Al-Hijr, where uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala towards the end of that surah says, worship Allah until certainty gets to you. And some Sufis say certainty is just the certainty about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this verse is saying that just worship Allah until you get that certainty and then you can stop. Meanwhile, the Prophet ﷺ was praying till the very last end and his last words on his uh, deathbed before he passed away وسلم, was as -salah, as -salah wa ma imam. He was warning us about prayer to keep worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So anybody that's going to claim that, oh, I don't need to pray, I don't need to do this. You know that these people are just uh, charlatans. And finally, he said, don't be deluded by karamat. Now, unfortunately, in this materialist world that we live in, 
a lot of Muslims have taken on this materialist understanding uh, without really being aware of it. And materialist basically says that, and I'll tell you what he said. He said, لو رأيتم رجلا قد تربع في الهواء فلا تقتدوا به حتى تروا صنعه عند الأمر والنهي. If you see a person who sits cross-legged in the air, and you see a lot of Hindus um, do this, um, and a lot of times it's just an optical illusion trick that they do. He says if you see someone who's sitting cross-legged in the air, ignore that. Don't worry about that. Look at their action when it comes to the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the prohibitions. And if you see that they're upholding the commandments and abstaining from the prohibitions, he says, فَاعْتَقِدُوا بِهِ وَاقْتَدُوا بِهِ then you can believe in that person. You can believe that that is a karama. A karama is basically a miracle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted one of his servants. Now, if you want a, a test for this, because some people go, like, how can, how can you sit in the air? And they want a materialistic explanation. Not realizing that it's, this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation, and he can do whatever he wants. And he can give anybody um, whatever... Karama, which is kind of an ennoblement that he wants to. And these are signs for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us that what you see in this cause and effect, this sequential action of the world that you see is just an illusion that they're connected with each other. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is creating every instant. So it's not rationally, maybe it's empirically based on your experience, impossible that someone can sit in the air. The reason you can't sit in the air is because of the density of the air as opposed to the density of the ground, the molecules, the connection, like a lot of, you can give a scientific explanation of why you can't. But can you imagine someone sitting in the air? Can you conceptualize it? The trick that you can go with is if Hollywood makes a movie about it and show, can show it in the movies, then it's in the realm of possibility. And just because you, in your limited experience, haven't seen something like that take place, it doesn't mean that it's impossible. What's impossible is having two opposites happen at exactly the same time. So to basically be moving still, like uh, changing location while staying in the same location. These are two opposite things that, and I'm, I'm, take, I'm saying from the same perspective, your mind can't even imagine such a thing happening. So... You know, the absence and the presence of something at the same time in exactly the same place. That's impossible. You can't do that. So he's saying that ignore what you see of mirac mirac miraculous or seems to be miraculous actions of people. That's not why you believe in someone of being righteous. You know, the awliya, these rightful, righteous servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ignore all of that. You look at their upholdment of the sharia. And so these are... Uh, the uh, the angles that Imam al junaid during his time was trying to deal with. Inshallah, in the next uh, session, we'll go into his first, uh, uh, his first, uh, well, it's not his first, but we'll go into some of his counsels with regards to how to basically transform your intellectual knowledge of Islam and Sharia, transform that, from external acts that you continue to do into internal realities so that you do them with the right intention, with the right perspective um, and so that you can actually end up succeeding in the hereafter when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says On a day where no wealth and no children will benefit except one who comes with a sound heart. And so that's really what Imam al Junaid's uh, councils and all of the other spiritual masters of the Islamic traditions councils were about. It's about rectifying the self and purifying the heart so that you can be successful in the next world. We'll uh, suffice with this insha'Allah and we'll continue in the next session. Jazakumullah khayran wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Subhanakallah wa bihamdika ashadu an la ilaha illa anta حاشا لجودك أن تقنط عاصيا الفضل أجزل والمواد
وَاجْتَنِبُوا الطَّاغُوتَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ 